wife, uh, Tracy, is my cousin sister. And uh, uh, so uh, Pastor Sandosh is my uh, brother-in-law. So uh, he's doing uh, his PhD in theology in Southwest uh, Theological Seminary, Texas. And, uh, you know, he has been used by God in, in mightly in, in different uh, capacities, capacities in India uh, as, as a pastor of a church and also uh, as uh, the Bible teacher and everything. So uh, we are so glad to have you, Pastor, with us this morning uh, to deliver the messages of God. And uh, as you are sitting in the presence of God, yeah, let us, uh, I mean, sit in the presence of God with a prayerful attitude so that uh, uh, God may speak to us this morning and uh, uh, let's all uh, put our hands together and welcome uh, Pastor Sandros Chako in our midst. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Good morning, church. Uh, a great appreciation to the choir for the wonderful singing, the selected songs, worship God together through that uh, uh, wonderful, uh, you know, songs. We are so glad to join the worship service with you this morning with my wife, Tracy, and uh, girls, Priscilla and uh, Phoebe. Uh, and I'm so thankful to Pastor Sam Gudichan and the, and the church for uh, your kind invitation and uh, also giving me this privilege to share the precious word with you today. Uh, though we are on this virtual platform, just uh, seeing each other and hearing each other with a lot of limitations, we together worship the Lord who is the same yesterday, today, and uh, forever. The ongoing pandemic could stop our physical fellowship, shut down our sanctuaries, but cannot stop our worship, hallelujah. Because worship is a non-stop activity of a born again child of God. So I praise God for that. Before I draw your attention to a particular passage, let me ask you a simple question. Maybe someone can you know, unmute and answer that question. It's very simple, the question is this. Can anyone tell me a unique biblical word that is used 24 times in the Hebrew Psalter? Psalter, I mean Psalms. And just four times in the New Testament. But it's a word that often used in our worship and pronounced same in most of the languages. Can anyone tell me what would be that unique word? Hallelujah. Repeat the question again. Is it hallelujah? Yes, exactly. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 19. Book of Revelation, chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. That's a passage selected for today's meditation. Uh, let me read first six verses from uh, book of Revelation, chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. I'm reading from New American Standard Bible. Chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. After these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous. For he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality. And he has avenged the blood of his bound servants on her. Three. And a second time they said, hallelujah. Her smoke raises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders, and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, Amen, hallelujah. And a voice 
came from the throne saying, give praise to our God, all you his bound servants, you who fear him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the almighty reigns. Fourfold hallelujah. Verse number one, verse number three, four and uh, six. Four times the word hallelujah is repeated in these six verses. Hallelujah. From the Hebrew, you know, the word actually it's from the Hebrew. It literally means praise the Lord. The word hallelujah occurring in the Psalms is a request for a congregation to join in praise toward God. So it can be translated as praise Yah, praise Yahweh, you people. That means praise the Lord, you people. Most well-known English, you know, English versions of the Hebrew Bible translate the Hebrew hallelujah as two Hebrew words, generally translated as let us praise and the Lord. Simply means let us praise the Lord. Let us praise the Lord. In the Hebrew Psalter, Psalter simply means Psalms, the word hallelujah is used for three specific themes. Number one, to praise God's power in creation. So that's the first theme related to the, related to the word hallelujah, to praise God's power in creation. Number two, to praise God in the liberation of the Israelites from the Egyptian bondage. That means the mighty act of redemption. The word hallelujah is related to the mighty act of redemption. And number three, to praise God in the blessings that God showers upon his people. So these are the three themes connected to the word hallelujah. Let me repeat to praise God's power in creation. Number two, to praise God in the, in the liberation of the Israelites from the Egyptian bondage. That means the mighty act of redemption. And number three, to praise God in the blessings that God showers upon his people. Now, to navigate your focus onto the passage which I read, let me give you a quick overview of the book of Revelation. A very brief, very quick overview. So that, that would give us an orientation to understand the passage clearly. If we turn to chapter one of the book of Revelation, chapter one verse 19 is the outline provided within the book. Verse number 19 says, therefore, Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. That is the, that's the outline of this last two book. The things which you have seen, that is chapter one, the glorious revelation of the resurrected Christ. That's chapter one. The things which are, chapters two and three, message to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Then the things which we shall take place after these things that cover the long portion of the book from chapter four through 22. So that is a simple outline of this book. Let me, let me give you a little more details uh, for the third division. Chapters 4 to 12, the things which shall take place, if I divide, you know, those chapters, chap 
chapters 4 to 18 is about the tribulation period. As Christians and as believers, we all know about the future tribulation. In the Bible, the future tribulation is called the 70th week of Daniel, the troublesome days of Jacob, the day of the Lord, the wrath of the Lamb, the great day of God's vengeance. These are some of the you know, different terms or the names used for the future tribulation, the future tribulation. So that is the content in chapters 4 to 18. John, when he was in the island of Patmos, so he, he had seen the visions and the chapters 4 to 18 is about the tribulation. In chapter 19, the major theme is the glorious appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. The second coming or the glorious appearance of Jesus Christ as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That is chapter 19. Chapter 20 is, the, is about the thousand year reign of Christ. We call it as the millennial kingdom, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. The last two chapters, chapters 21 and 22, the new heaven and the new earth connecting with the eternity. So these are the themes or the content in this whole book. In chapter 19, as I mentioned, it's about the second coming of Christ. But just before that, the first 10 verses, we read about a great heavenly worship, a glorious worship that is after the great tribulation. Because in chapter 19, verse 1 says, after these things, that means this glorious worship in heaven happening after the tribulation. So you, you, I, will, I will give you a little more clues that we will, we will understand Again, a little more details of that particular passage. In view of dispensational hermeneutical method, that means the method that we try to understand the prophecy, the seven year tribulation. We know the, 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 the tribulation, it is going to be seven years. The seven year tribulation will be the climax of all human government and authority. Number two, the seven year period will be the climax of human technologies. So I see this COVID time is a kind of digital preparation of the world, moving towards that great day of the Lord. Number three, the seven year tribulation period will be the climax of human religious systems. Number four, the seven years tribulation period will be the climax of lawlessness and abomination. Number four, the seven year tribulation period will be the climax of satanic demo you know, demonstration acting as God. Because during that period, particularly, he will imitate the triune God. That's what we read in the book of Revelation. Just as, you know, he will Im imitate, imitate the triune God, the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because in chapters 12 and 13, we see a kind of satanic trin trinity. Satan, the old serpent, as a supernatural false God, would act as God the Father. Chapter 13, verse 2, the beast coming out of the sea who is the Antichrist, the political leader will act as Christ. Then in the same chapter, chapter 13 verses 12, 11 and 12, the second beast coming up out of the earth, the false prophet, who is the religious leader will act as spirit, as spirit. That means according to the book of Revelation, during this dark period of great tribulation, under the supernatural power and skill of Satan, and I, Christ, and the false prophet will control the political and religious systems of the world. 
In chapter 17 of Revelation, John describes the ultimate downfall or destruction of the religious Babylon. We read the mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and of the ab abominations of the earth. In chapter 18, that means chapter 18 describes the ultimate destruction of the political and commercial Babylon. After these two major destructions, the destruction of the powerful religious system and the political system, Apostle John envisions the glorious heavenly worship. And the stage is set for the climax of the book of Revelation, the second coming of Christ. One commentator said, Revelation chapters 4 to 18 dealt primarily with the events of the great tribulation. Beginning in chapter 19, there is a noticeable change. The great tribulation is now coming to its end and the spotlight focuses on heaven and the second coming of Christ. For the saints and the angels, it is a time of rejoicing and victory. My brothers, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, that is the immediate context of chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Point number one. The hallelujah or worship of the great multitude in heaven, verses 1 through 3. Chapter 19, verses 1, 2, and 3. The hallelujah or worship of the great multitude in heaven. The word hallelujah is used twice in these three verses. And if we look into that passage, it is not a silent worship. The great multitude in heaven worship the Lord, one who is seated on the throne. It's not a silent worship. It's a loud worship. It's a loud worship. That's what we read there. Psalm number 100 says, Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with the gladness. Come before, uh, before him with the joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not the ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Yender his gates with the thanksgiving and his courts with the praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. And his faithfulness to all generations. A glorious worship. A loud worship in heaven. If you go through the, the entire Bible, there are some unique uh, scriptures where we see the beauty and glory of worship. So let me show you a few passages in the scripture where the glory of worship is highlighted. These are some of the familiar passages for all of us. The first verse is from Isaiah, book of Isaiah chapter 6. Verses 1 through 4. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Let me read that, uh, that passage. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With the two he covered his face, and with the two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Verse number four. And the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with the smoke. Oh, glorious worship by the seraphim. 
another scripture from the New Testament. Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. John, chapter 4, 23 and 24. Jesus said, But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshippers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in, worship in spirit and truth. Another passage, that's from the book of Revelation, before the tribulation. Chapter 19, the worship in heaven is after the tribulation, but before the tribulation, you now we read about a worship in heaven. That's in chapter 4. Chapter 4, book of Revelation, chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. Chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night, they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Again, in chapter 15, we read about a worship of the Lamb of God, another beautiful picture of worship. Yes. Chapter 19 in heaven, the great multitude with a loud voice, they worship. There are two reasons for this hallelujah or this heavenly worship. If you look into that two, you know, first two verses, there are two reasons. Reason number one, hallelujah or praise the Lord because salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Verse number one. Praise the Lord. Worship the Lord who is seated on top because salvation belongs to God. We know the whole scripture, the theme of whole scripture is redemption, the salvation. The book of Jonah. Chapter 2, verse 9 says, salvation is from the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Then it says, glory belongs to God. The ultimate purpose of the history, the entire history is doxology. That means the glory of God. So here the, the, the great multitude in heaven, they praise God. They're worshiping God because Glory belongs to God. In Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8, we read, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Glory belongs to our God. And again, it says, power belongs to God. Salvation belongs to God. Glory belongs to God. Power belongs to God. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The Almighty. Salvation, glory, and power belong to our God. There is a reason for these great terms used in this particular passage because in the context of tribulation for the seven years, Satan has been falsely claiming and acting as if he is the savior. That is the immediate context. For the seven years uh, tribulation period, Satan would or the Antichrist would act as if he is the savior. He has been deceiving the world with his false glory and power. 
the previous chapters we read about it in chapter 12 verse 9 we read the great dragon was torn down the serpent of the old who is called the devil and satan who deceives the whole world verse number 10 says now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our god and the authority of his christ have come for the accuser of our brethren has been torn down that's the first reason for this heavenly worship or the hallelujah salvation power and glory belong to our god the second reason is in verse number 2 hallelujah or praise the lord because his judgments are true and righteous that is the second reason given in the passage the judgments his judgments are true and righteous the one who is seated on the throne is a righteous judge that's a meaning because he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality and he has avenged the blood of his bound servants on her the destruction of the great prostitute in chapter 17 was one and verse number 4 is a proper act of vengeance for her much you know for uh, her martyring the servants of the lord because in chapter 17 was 6 we read and i saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of jesus 19 verse 3 says he punished her forever the righteous king the righteous judge who is seated on the throne he punished he punished the harlot the religious system which was against the true worship and the true worshipers of the true god yes first of all the great multitude in heaven with a loud voice worship the one who is seated on the throne because salvation power and glory and the righteousness belong to him number 2 the second hallelujah verses 4 to 4 uh, and 5 the hallelujah of 24 elders and four living creatures in the first part the great multitude here 24 elders and the four living creatures it's a visual picture of a true worship 24 elders and four living creatures fell down and worshiped it's a literal meaning of the word worship in the scripture kissing the ground kiss the ground it's not talking about kissing the the mother earth according to the indian context no it's an act of respect saying that we are nothing we are nothing before this awesome and great god yes we are nothing dear brothers and sisters when you when you and me see the glory of our savior the greatness of our heavenly father we are nothing we were weak we were sinners we were dead in trespasses and sins but through jesus christ our savior we are given the gift of salvation in free of cost therefore we have the access to this most holy god and worship that great god that great god in revelation chapter 4 verses 9 to 11 we read a similar picture which is which ha, you know which which is happening before the tribulation 
the passage that we read in chapter 19 is after tribulation. There's a similar scene in heaven before the tribulation. That is in chapter 4, verses 9 to 11. Let me read that passage. Revelation chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and our God to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things. And because of you, because of your will, they existed and were created. Look at that words. So profound. The one who is seated on the throne, worshipped by 24 elders and living creatures, saying, Lord, you are worthy. You alone is worthy. You are worthy to receive glory and honor. In this passage, more than I'm looking for the identity of 24 elders and living creatures, the act of their worship is important. At the same time, let me give you a uh, little bit about the identity of these uh, 24 elders. Four different suggestions are uh, given to identify these 24 elders. These are the suggestions. The suggestion number one, these 24 elders are representing 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles of the New Testament. That is the suggestion number one. Second suggestion, 24 elders represent the New Testament church. Third suggestion is, these 24 elders are representing the Old Testament saints. The fourth suggestion is, based on 1 Chronicles chapter 24, verses 1 through 5, the sons of Aaron divided into 24 groups for their priestly service. So these 24 elders represent the Aaronic priesthood. These are the four suggestions. And the four living creatures, in view of chapters 4, 5, 6, 14, 15, and 19, these living creatures are angelic beings. Chapter 4 talks about it. Chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 14, chapter 15, and in chapter 19, we read about these living creatures. They are representing the heavenly beings or angels. Look at verse number 5. In verse number 5, an invitation from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bound servants, you who fear him, the small and the great. Yes, worship is our responsibility. It is our right. Let me highlight a quote here. Worship is an act of obedience of the heart. It is a response that requires the very core of who you are to love the Lord for who he is, not just for what he does. I repeat, worship is an act of obedience of the heart. It's a response that requires the very core of who you are to love the Lord for who he is, not just for what he does. Worship is for everyone. 
no discrimination among the worshippers yes 24 elders and the you know, four living creatures threw themselves before the throne of god and worshiped let me go to the the last uh, portion of the text point number 3 chapter 19 verses 6 to 10 chapter 19 verses 6 through 10 the hallelujah again of the great multitude for the prophetic proclamation of the reign and the wedding of the lamb that's what we read from verses 6 through 10 the hallelujah or the praise the lord worship god because it's a pro- prophetic proclamation of the reign and the wedding of the lamb let me read those verses verse number 6 then i hear i heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters and like the sound of many uh, mighty peals of thunder saying hallelujah for the lord our god the, the almighty reigns let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen bright and clean for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints verse number 9 then he said to me right blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb and he said to me these are true words of god then i fell at his feet to worship him but he said to me do not do that do not do that i am a fellow servant of your yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of jesus worship god for the testimony of jesus is the spirit of prophecy hallelujah of the great multitude for the prophetic proclamation of the reign and the wedding of the lamb here the joyful loud worship is prophetic for what is about to happen the great anticipation of the coming of christ let me list some points there point number 1 rejoice and worship for the lord our god the almighty reigns verse number 6 God's people rejoice and worship because our savior the king of kings and the lord of lords is going to reign a righteous kingdom is going to come his kingdom is at hand we hear with a great rejoicing with a loud noise the great multitude they worship because our lord god the almighty reigns number 2 rejoice and be glad and give the glory to god for the marriage of the lamb has come the marriage of the lamb has come yes we are eagerly waiting for the day as the church the new testament the bride of christ eagerly waiting for the bridegroom it will, it would happen in the imminent future we do not know that would happen you know that would happen or the coming of christ would happen in our generation here is the picture saying rejoice and be glad and give glory to god for the marriage of the lamb has come number 3 rejoice and be glad for the bride of the bridegroom has made herself ready it means 
the church is ready we are ready yes we are we are the members of that church we are part of you know that bride it says the church is ready church is ready for the wedding number 4 rejoice and be glad for the bride the church is rewarded with the wedding dress the fine linen bright and clean and it says and the fine linen is the reward for her labor on the earth yes we are doing so much of things now for a reward for the reward according to this scripture once you and me stand before our bridegroom our glorious bridegroom lord jesus christ we are going to have some glorious reward <coughs> it says that glorious reward <coughs> would be the the wedding dress what is that wedding dress the fine linen bright and clean then gives the interpretation the fine linen is the reward for her righteous labor on this earth john the apostle from the island of patmos watching this glorious heavenly worship in verse number 9 the angel said to john john write blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb here is a group of invited for the marriage supper i am not going to tell you who are those people maybe this week you can you know have a serious thinking and a study to find out who are these invited people for the marriage supper angels say you know said john write down blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb <coughs> apostle john who was watching this glorious majestic and incredible worship and events in heaven heard a voice from the angel saying these are true words of god these are true words of god when john heard these words in verse number 10 says he fell at his feet to worship him but the angel said john do not do that do not do that you have been watching the worship of great multitude <coughs> 24 elders the living creatures do not do that i am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of jesus worship god look at that verse worship god for the testimony of jesus is a spirit of prophecy simply means the very nature or the purpose of prophecy is to testify jesus christ and to bring glory to him the ultimate message angel gives here is true worship belongs to true god true worship belongs to true god worship god not angels not men worship god oh what a glorious message a perfect picture of heavenly worship why hallelujah here why this worship because salvation and glory and power belong to our god his right his judgments are true and righteous both angels and saints worship the one who is seated on the throne he alone is almighty he alone is righteous king and his kingdom is at hand 
a famous New Testament scholar, D.A. Carson said, worship is a proper response to all moral sentient being to God, ascribing all honor and worth to our creator God precisely because he is worthy, delightfully so. I repeat, worship is a proper response of all moral sentient being to God, ascribing all honor and word to their creator God precisely because he is worthy, delightfully so. Worship is a moral, you know, there is another, another, another famous quotation. Worship is more than singing beautiful songs in the church on Sunday. It is more than instrument and music. As a true worshiper, your heart will always long for worshiping him in all ways and with all your life. Always and all your life. Yes, today we worship our God, invisible God, with the Lord of limitations, but in the imminent future, we are going to see the glory of our heavenly father. Isaiah chapter 35, 10, we read, and the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful singing to Zion, with the everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They will find gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning will flee away. Let us keep singing the hallelujah song. Yes, let us prepare ourselves to enter that celestial and glorious home. As I mentioned, we live in this uncertain time. In the midst of this pandemic situation, let us be a constant worshiper of God. The virus can shut down the sanctuaries, may shut down the physical presence and fellowship, not the worship, not the worship. Let us be a constant worshiper of God, knowing that our worship on this earth is always in view of the glorious heavenly worship, the glorious heavenly worship that we are eagerly waiting for. Today we have limitations. We have difficulties. We go through a lot of struggles in our lives, sickness, death, sorrows and pain. But there is a day, there's a day that we will listen to the voice of our Lord. The archangel will shout the trumpet. We will listen to the voice of our master. And we'll, we will see his glorious face and will have a glorious worship in the feet of our God who is seated on the throne. Let me conclude my message with another quote. When we turn our worries into worship, God will turn our battles into blessings. When we turn our worries into worship, God will turn our battles into blessings. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the rest of our life, let us be a constant worshiper, not just a day, not twice a, twice a, you know, not, not twice a week, not thrice a week, a constant worshiper in view of the glorious worship that is ahead of us. May the great God bless all of us and strengthen all of us to continue our hallelujah song 
for the glory of God until the last moment of our life. May the great God bless all of us. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God.